Hello and welcome to the final day of Drive NAP Next 2021. I'm Miriam Hernandez Cakel, Global Head of Management Consulting for KPMG and a longtime NAP partner. Today's theme, Paving the Way for Success, really thinking about how we create and expand opportunities for our students to be successful. At KPMG, we believe 100% in NAP's mission, both that college and career readiness are critical to the health of our society and the future of our economy. However, it's not enough to believe. We must also do. And so companies like KPMG and others need to act on it, and we are. At KPMG and myself personally, we have been very involved over the last few years and helping to bring broad-based learning experience and internships to NAP students, including in being a founding partner of NAP's Future Ready Labs, something I'm passionate about. I remember being in a room having the very first conversations that JD was driving around the need for these Future Ready Labs and turning an idea and concept that JD had into a reality. And since then, many of us are participating and the number of labs are growing. I remember, of course, also that we at KPMG support NAF's accounting curriculum. Of course, you would think we would do that. And most importantly, we have uh, advisory board members in over 20 locations across the country. We really like to think of ourselves at KPMG as all-in partners, something that NAF likes to talk about. I personally have been involved with the STEM committee and the work of NAF for some years now, uh, being recruited by our friends at Verizon to participate actively, both myself and KPMG. And it has really been proud and fortunate moments for KPMG for the work that we do with NAF. So one of the things that really is very successful at NAF are the partnerships that we form and how we stand shoulder to shoulder with other businesses and other companies to support NAF's work. Companies like Lenovo. Lenovo, a longtime partner of NAF, has been the sponsor for several years now, maybe seven, of the mobile application competition. And even in the face of the pandemic and other economic downturns, when programs were being cut, Lenovo never wavered from their sponsorship and really thought about this program as a way, this app development program and competition, as a way to create greater interest within high school students and particularly high school students in underinvested communities to learn more about science and technology, engineering and mathematics, really the STEM curriculum. And not only the high tech skills needed, but also all of the characteristics of what it takes to be um, available and prepared in today's job market. So this is a competition that gets a lot of teams involved from different NAF academies across the country. They spend, the students spend months developing these applications that they can then use in the service of either a community uh, project or at their own schoolwork. There's a lot of enthusiasm with the students and the sponsors. I want, to, I want us to hear a special message from uh, Libby Richards of Lenovo as she walks us through why this is an important program why Lenovo continues and has a lot of passion around sponsoring it. So let's take a look and see what Libby has to say. Hello, NAF Nation. Libby Richards, Community Engagement Manager at Lenovo here. On behalf of all of us at Lenovo, I'd like to thank the students and teachers who participated in this year's Lenovo Scholar Network mobile app development competition. Lenovo has been a proud partner of NAVS for almost a decade. The Lenovo Foundation and our business is committed long-term to investing in STEM education and increasing access to opportunity for underinvested communities. 
We're proud to make a difference for the next generation of innovators and leaders. Our vision as a company is to provide smarter technology for all, and we want to ensure that we live up to that promise. All students should have access to the technology needed to ensure that they can continue their education, whether that's in a classroom or at home. Smarter technology can solve problems, create opportunities, and transform the way we all live. As we conclude our seventh year of partnership with NAP, we are so proud to share that Lenovo has provided work-based learning, internships, and mobile app development opportunities to NAF students across the country. The Lenovo Scholar Network is open to students in all NAF Academy themes so that all students have equal opportunity to learn the essential technology skills needed for industry and professions in today's global marketplace. A panel of more than 45 Lenovo employees served as judges to pick this year's winners. During a continued time of uncertainty and needing to pivot to do their work differently, these young people demonstrated innovation, problem solving, and critical thinking skills as they adjusted to a second school year that was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. There were many amazing apps developed, all designed to address a need identified by their school or their greater community. To quickly recap the winners, CryptoShake 2.0 from Mallard Creek High School Academy of Engineering in Charlotte, North Carolina, is a password management app that helps users avoid being hacked by instantly generating and saving a secure and random password. Cycles from South Dade Senior High School Academy of Information Technology in Miami, Florida, is a budgeting and finance app that allows young people to review their monthly spending, calculate a tip, and learn more about saving money and budgeting effectively. Destigmatizing Healthcare from Enlow High School Academy of Health Sciences in Raleigh, North Carolina is an app that aims to provide students of diverse backgrounds with easy access to information on mental and sexual health resources. Local Tutor from Clarence High School Academy of Business and Finance in Clarence, New York is an app designed to provide easy access to free tutoring to help alleviate the difficulties that come with transitioning to remote learning. OHS Emergency App from Arosi High School Academy of Engineering and Green Technology in Arosi, California is an app that provides students with the crucial information that's needed in the event of an emergency at their high school. Okay, now for the moment we've all been waiting for, the announcement of this year's fan favorite. Thanks a lot, Libby, and drum roll, please. The winner for this year of the fan favorite is the Destigmatization Healthcare from Enloe High School at the Academy of Health Sciences in Raleigh, North Carolina, represented by Lydia Owens and Lindsay Templeton. Such congratulations. This whole idea of uh, destigmatizing healthcare is so important and uh, proud of that team that they came through. So congratulations to the team and their sponsors. Congratulations and applause for all the participants. As I said earlier, we had many. And thank you to Libby for that very thorough explanation so that we can all get an appreciation for how important this competition is in the lives of our students as they prepare for future work. Um, and to the winners, NAF will be in touch with you to let you know about your prize. So again, congratulations. All right, let's move on now to one of the other awards we're gonna represent today, or we're gonna give out today, one that I'm very excited about and representing all of my colleagues at KPMG. Um, we were NAV's 2020 Internship Champion Award winner. And it's with great pleasure that I announced this year's uh, this year's winner uh, on a program that is, as I said earlier, near and dear to my heart because I believe internships are at the heart of really giving career opportunities to our students. So for another drum roll, our dear friends at Verizon have won the 2021 award. And it gives me great, great pleasure to be here announcing that. You know, I've known, I, I know Verizon very, very well. As I said earlier, it was through the work of Nikki Palmer and others at Verizon that I became 
involved in NAF and, and that KPMG was put on the board and our own CEO joined. It was really through the work of Verizon that pulled us into NAF. And it's, I'm very grateful for that. But I know that Verizon is very committed to internships in their own company, not only from NAF, where they have hosted over 500 interns since 2014. I know for a fact, because I was in the room, when we were really talking about the summer interns and how to get around the high school um, uh, challenges of having high school interns, how to make that work, Verizon was the first to make it work and then really shared that information. I remember Nikki Palmer and I sitting in a room with, with other colleagues from other companies, bringing our HR people in and really trying um, to get this to be a broadly accepted practice, which it now is. And Verizon has continued that. They've continued it with being an active participant and leader in the um, in the Ready Now Labs, uh, the summer internships, having people in their company across the country, and also doing remote internships. So again, it's not only with NAF that Verizon does this and does it quite well, but it's a belief that they have. And you're going to hear Christy Pombianchi, who is their chief um, human, uh, human resources officer. You're going to hear Christy talk about the importance of internships to Verizon. And I'm so proud to have her here today accepting this award. Thank you, Miriam. I am so honored to accept this award on behalf of Verizon and our employees. At Verizon, we believe the best and brightest minds could come from anywhere. That's why we are proud of our long-standing relationship with NAF and have supported the internship program for many years. To be named an internship champion speaks to the value we place on cultivating talent from the earliest points in their career. Internships open the door to finding great people often from non-traditional backgrounds, and bring them into Verizon. In fact, many of our V-teamers started as interns, and now they're building the future and creating a more connected world. The work NAF does to encourage and support students in STEM are critical to building a workforce ready for the future. Exceptional talent is out there. Let's make sure everyone has the access and support to work to their full potential. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christy. I love the way you talked about great minds come from anywhere. I love that phrase. I hope you don't mind if uh, you hear me quoting it at some other time. So I'm gonna move on now to talk about our this year's advisory board chair champion. Uh, sorry, advisory board champion. I apologize for that. Um, I wanna introduce Dave Smith. He's the director of our, um, he's the director of aftermarket operations at Pratt and Whitney, which is a Raytheon company. Um, Dave and I had a chance to chat a little bit before the session today, and I'm just really thrilled about the way that conversation went. And we're going to give you a bit of that live um, in a few minutes. I'm just going to talk a little bit about why he was selected as the champion. By the way, in addition to his day job, he is also the chair of the Academy of Engineering and Green Technology at Hartford High School. So he's a very strong participant in, um, in the NAF program. Um, you know, during the pandemic, during a very tumultuous school year, when many programs were being canceled, internships were hard to come by, students were getting restless and maybe feeling like they weren't really getting the best out of their education, Dave really was um, right in the middle and very active in making sure that internships and other career opportunities, whether remote, um, could be worked and could be available to these students at Hartford High School. He worked with different local companies to have virtual programs, to have guest speakers, to be himself mentoring and advocating on behalf of the students and really showed the kind of commitment that we at NAF um, and all the companies that work with NAF love about this. It's that kind of passion and commitment to say, the students are our future and what do we need to do to get them ready and to give them the opportunity and open the door. Because if you've spent any time 
with in an academy or with a group of NAF students, you will be wowed forever and you will understand what opening the door to people's talents and to people's passions can do. So without any further ado, let me ask Dave to come on stage with me and say a few words. Congratulations, Dave. Thank you, Miriam. Absolutely. I, I'm really honored. Uh, it is an honor, you know, to be recognized by NAF, but I think more importantly, uh, I would say I'm very grateful to be working with a very dedicated and resilient um, group of advisory committee members. Um, uh, these folks, many of them have been with the Academy since its inception 12 years ago. So they're tenured in this role, but they were really up to the challenge that the COVID pandemic uh, presented to us and our students. I'm also very proud, uh, you know, to be able to represent Pratt and work for Pratt uh, and, and, and in the broader sense, Raytheon Technologies, you know, because they, Raytheon in particular, you really encourage us to com connect with our communities. And, and when we do, we feel the support in real ways. And, and I would say, you know, I, I've got a great job. Um, I get a job where I go to work, I do my day stuff, right? But then I get to fulfill some of the passions that I have, and it really is around students and, uh, and education in the community in general, but particularly to see the growth of students where in, in, in many cases they're underserved. And so uh, making these opportunities available uh, and, and reaching into support means a lot. So really, really thankful and, and, and really honored for this uh, award. Well, congratulations again. And um, as I was saying before you came on, you and I had a chance to chat prior to um, to coming on live today. And I thought we kind of jumped right into a flow of conversation that, of course, it's on every uh, business person's mind these days. And I want to share a little bit of that. So um, I want to start out by asking you, about um, what what's the future look like? What kind of skills, what kind of jobs are our businesses, especially in the technology business, which is what you know you and I are near and dear to, but uh, but just in business in today's reality, what are the skill sets and what are the roles and jobs that you think uh, we need students to prepare for? Yeah, I, I think in, in general, you know, we have to have business. Uh, needs to really be focused on the skills that are going to be necessary for success in the 21st century. And so what may have been core uh, 30 years ago um, might not suit our needs. We're advancing. Technology is, you know, such a big part of everything we do. You know, we are introducing things like robotics and automation in many of our operations. And so we need to prepare both the professionals and the hourly um, associates that join our companies with those requisite skills. And so it's, we're acutely aware of that challenge and the need to build that pipeline. And for that to happen, there really needs to be a clear partnership with education where uh, we're enabling that delivery of those um, programs, um, coursework, and in, um, inserting ourselves into formation of curriculum that helps to build those skills. Because by doing so and by partnering with that uh, education community, that's how we ensure that we'll be able to hold whatever competitive edge we have. It will not be simply by being stagnant. We have to be very proactive and deliberate in that talent development. Uh, it's, uh, I, I completely agree with you. What do you think about these um, additional sort of, people used to call them soft skills, but I don't really think they're soft. I think they're probably harder in some ways. And that's this whole collaboration, democratization of technology, the ability to work with teams, just this whole idea that uh, leadership styles and empathetic approaches to work. Uh, you and I were talking a little bit about the, you know, the up and coming generation, not just even the millennials. And what kind of skills in addition to the technical skills do, do you think they need to have to be prepared and to be successful in this new economy? Um, well, I would say, you know, communication is a given. We want all of our employees and as students transition to the world of work, they need to be able to communicate both written and, and, and verbally. That's a key, but the collaboration aspect, so much of what we do is on teams. 
Um, they've lived that in the last, if they didn't believe it before, they learned it like we do in corporate America, that you need to collaborate and the tools that we saw become um, used extensively enable that community, that collaboration. Um, but again, just being able to, you know, present their ideas, um, take something very complex and technical and simplify it, um, working with the teams, like I mentioned, um, those are some of the things that, you know, especially when they get a NAP internship, these uh, students get to practice and they get to see real uh, firsthand how it's done in, uh, in the workplace. Um, yeah. So shifting a little bit to what educators and the educational community can expect from business. Certainly that's a lot of the mission of NAF, but how do you see it? What can educators expect from us? Um, I think they they should, and hopefully, I can, and, I, and I'm speaking from the Raytheon's perspective, but they should expect an eager partner. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we were learning together. We were thrust into a virtual environment, and so were the students and the educators. I think, I mean, many of the students might have a little bit been a little bit more adept at the tools, but I, I saw our educators, our teachers, great, great. Uh, talented, dedicated people, many struggled with the technology, but we worked through it. And so they should see an eager partner in business. We are willing to step forward and assist. Uh, like I mentioned before, whether it's through curriculum, offering internship, work-based learning, and the work-based learning and experience is not limited to just the students. There's opportunities to help educators understand what we do and how we do it. And so they can translate that in their curriculum and delivery of it. So there's a lot of things that we can do and just enabling resources, uh, bringing resources to the table. I think um, there is clearly um, a sense that um, the business community understands better. Many of the conversations we were having with leadership meetings were people getting on and saying, oh my goodness, please excuse me, my son is next to me doing his homework and he's on Zoom too and the dog is with us. And so we had to adjust to all of that in real time. So we are acutely aware of what that, those challenges are. And in business, I think we're even more ready to help. Um, and so I think that's the opportunity for business to partner more so with uh, education. I love that. I couldn't agree with you more. I want to ask one final question, one that you and I talked about and that I think is so critical and I've become very passionate about. And that's really cool. what do we need to do to lean in to support our students? And I hope they don't cut us off before we uh, finish this. <laughs> because, uh, you know, what is it we need to do to lean in? We've talked about all the help and uh, remote work and all of that. But w what are all the key parts of how we lean in to help our students be career ready? Um, I think we step forward, offer resources. You know, the pandemic, if there was an underserved community that was struggling and there was an education gap, Miriam, it's only gotten worse as a result of the pandemic. It's gotten easier. So, you know, at Raytheon, we said we're going to double down in our commitment to the community and in our commitment to STEM and even with math. But I think other corporations need to do the same. Uh, and really step forward and offer their resources and support. There's a lot of talent, a lot of knowledge in many of our organizations that we can bring that to bear with the education community. And I think making ourselves available, not just through our knowledge, but through resources is what's going to make a difference. Yeah, and I'll just add one closing comment before we move on that adds on what to what you're saying or builds on what you're saying. Companies need to be clear about what their purpose and their values are because our students coming up, young people coming up are looking to work at companies where they agree with the purpose and the values. They, you told me a story about one of your direct reports who was saying, hey, can I really fill my personal purpose when I'm spending so many, many hours on the job? I think that's more common for our future leaders and workforce uh, than it has ever been. And so companies, we need to lean in and make sure we're clear about what our purpose and what our values are. And so that these future employees and leaders can identify and say, yes, I want to work at that place. No, I, I totally agree. You know, uh, a comment that JD made at the very opening of this conference was that she said technology got us through uh, during the COVID time, but uh, technology um, will not sustain us. And so people, we, our passion and our commitment is what will sustain our program. And so uh, that resonated with me because like I mentioned before, 
um, I am, I'm, I'm privileged because I get to do my job and I can fulfill a passion and feel like I'm moving towards a purpose. But many of our employees are demanding that. And so where companies can allow that platform and like I mentioned, enable it and support it when, it, when, they, when they seek to uh, do so, I think we'll have a, a combination of a really good situation for both employee and employees, employer and employees, I should say. Thank you so, mo so much, Dave. Thank you for the dialogue. Congratulations to you. And I really hope we get to continue this conversation off screen. Absolutely. Thanks, Marion. Thank you. I want to move quickly now, and I apologize to our keynote speaker and to the program uh, staff. I really apologize, but I, Dave's so fabulous, I didn't want to cut off the conversation. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Jane Mee Kassip, a former education, the former education evangelist for Google, who is our keynote speaker for today. And from my part and from KPMG's part, thank you very much for participating today. It's been my pleasure to be here with you. I know how important these uh, conferences are every year. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Jamie Kassap or Jaime Kassap, depending on what language you speak. I, um, uh, I'm excited to be here. So welcome to my temporary studio here in Sedona, Arizona. Uh, I wanna do a couple minutes of a, of a quick background uh, of who I am, what I wanna, wh where I, wh what I'm working on, and then I wanna be able to answer a bunch of questions. So give me a couple minutes to kind of set the stage here in terms of what we wanna talk about. So first, my name is Jamie Kassab, or Jaime Kassab, depending on what language you speak. Uh, I was the uh, chief education evangelist at Google for uh, 15 years. I launched Google Apps for Education into the university space. I launched uh, Google Apps in the K-12, and then one of the craziest ideas I've ever had in my life is I launched Chromebooks in education back in 2011, and then a bunch of other things that you know, might not know about. But anyway, so I, I spent a lot of time working on this idea of how do we integrate technology and education? And what does that look like? Um, I recently uh, left uh, Google, uh, or not recently, but last year left Google to kind of work on some of the things that I'm really passionate about, especially around diversity, inclusion, and access. And how do we incorporate all these things um, it, with technology? So. So that kind of sets the stage as to who I am. And my passion for education is personal. Uh, I am a first generation American. I grew up in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Um, I grew up on welfare and food stamps with a single mother, uh, you know, all the, in a very violent community. You know, I'm talking about Hell's Kitchen from the 70s and 80s, not the one that you find. Uh, well, today it feels like it's going back to that. but. Uh, it was the old days, the old uh, 70s and 80s in, in, in New York City. Now, my passion for education comes from this idea that the reason I get to talk to you and I get to have the, the life that I've been able to have is because of education. And the problem that I'm trying to solve, and we'll come back to that in a minute, but the problem I'm trying to solve is to, to create opportunities and experiences for other students who are growing up the way I grew up, because I don't get to meet a lot of people with my background in positions of power and influence. And I think that's what it's gonna take to really change things, to really change society. Jobs are not going to change things. Structural systematic things that we need to do are gonna change things. So that's kind of where my focus is and where my passion is. Now I wanna start by kind of setting the stage here and again, I'll be able to answer questions in a couple of minutes, but I want to start with this idea, and, and, I, and I was listening to, to the program so far, but this idea around where we are today. And let's talk about digitalization. And, and what I mean by digitalization, I mean everything that has to do with technology, uh, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, AR, VR, automation, robotics, any of those things, right? That, that to me is digitalization. And what we need to understand is that we are at the very, 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 very beginning of this. I hope I emphasize that enough. I, I mean like cavemen and women with sticks and, and trying to light a fire, right? So, you know, I, I giggle when I read articles or see articles about Zoom fatigue or too much technology or how technology is integrating into our life. Like we, we have no concept of, of of what's coming, and, I, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Google had a breakthrough uh, in quantum computing right before I left last year, and 
And the best way to describe the breakthrough in quantum computing is like this. When, if you took one of those mathematical equations and, and that spin forever, and you fed it to a supercomputer, it would take that supercomputer 10,000 years to process that equation, right? The breakthrough that Google had with quantum computing is that they did it in 200 seconds. 10,000 years versus 200 seconds, right? So as much as we talk about, like, you know, we see all these, we see technology in, 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 in everything that we do, we see technology integrated in, in, in work, in life, and everything. We're using technology right now. You know, uh, the, 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 what's happening with uh, self-driving cars and the fact that 4.5 million people in this country make a living driving things, but you can buy a self-driving car today. When we think about all this integration with technology and, 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 we, and we think we're on a cutting edge uh, system, uh, we, we think that technology has become this big part of our lives, what we need to understand is that we are at the very beginning of this. And it's an important factor to think about, right? So, because as much as you think the latest and greatest technology is that you have, here's another way to think about that example that I just gave you, which is that in 2019, 2019, um, and, and in technology years, that's like 27 years ago, but in 2019, Google's quantum computer, Google's quantum computers was 158 million times faster than the world's fastest supercomputer. That's a big number to try to understand, but think of it this way. Everything that you see with technology right now, everything that you see with your processors and everything that's processing all kinds of different things with, with computing, you need to understand that everything that you see right now is 158 million times slower than what's coming. That's the world that we're living in. And what we need to, the reason I bring this up is because when we look at education and we think about what we need, need to do in education, we have to ask ourselves a very simple question, which is if we are teaching students things that we know machines are gonna do better, are we failing our students? I think we are. So I think what we need to do, and this is gonna be sound ironic when we're talking about technology and digitalization, what we need to do is not worry about technology at all, but double down on what I call human skills. And, I, and, and, and by human skills, I mean problem solving, creativity, the ability to learn, collaboration, critical thinking, right? Those, those things. Uh, I, I was listening to the program and I heard some of the speakers talk about it as, you know, as uh, 21st century skills. Uh, I, don't, I don't like the phrase 21st century skills because one, we're 21 years into the 21st century. And two, it feels like it's a phrase that we use to talk about the future, right? Like, like, like 21st century skills for the future. No, 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 my six-year-old needs those skills now, right? And so uh, another, another trigger phrase for me is when you call them soft skills. They're not soft skills. They're absolutely essential skills. They're, they're, they are, I'm 53 years old. I've yet to master any of those skills, right? So, so those things, and, and why I'm, I bring those up is because I could care less what my six-year-old learns, right? So I want her to start, she's starting first grade, and I want her at the end of it to be able to read better. I want her to be able to write better. I want her to have more advancements and, and, and ideas around, you know, how she thinks about things, right? And I want her to understand math. And, and don't get me started on math, but not math as a subject, because math is not a subject. There is no subjects in math. Math is life. You know, my six-year-old knows and understands that math is in everything. Everything includes math. Everything involves math, whether it's man-made or natural. Everything has a mathematical formula and equation to it. And she sees math that way, not as subjects, but as, as she advances her math skills, she advances her knowledge of how the world works, period, right? That's what math looks like. So I want her to know that. Now, besides that, I could really, I don't think I could care less what subjects she learns. As a matter of fact, I would love it if she, dri she drove what those subjects were. I, it, you know, if you wanted to teach her, if she wanted to learn about, you know, the ancient art of, you know, Chinese shoelace tying in the Ming Dynasty, that's fine. If she wanted to learn about the history of candles in Europe, that's I don't care what the subject is. 
What I care is that she's learning those skills while she's learning those subjects, that she's learning how to problem solve and critically think and collaborate and, and be creative and knows how to learn, right? Those are the things that are the most critical because the subjects do not matter. We have access to all the world's information and so we can learn any subject we want at any given time. And if we have those skills, we can learn them in even a better way. So, so that's what we need to focus on, right? Th those critical things. Now, I, before I start answering questions, I want, I want to talk about uh, you know, two things about that, right? Number one is the ability to learn. Um, because it's important to understand that I do not mean the ability to learn in the traditional education system, right? Which is the ability to take tests, the ability to outline things, the ability to study, that's not what I mean by learning. That's not learning. I, I mean the ability to learn starts with a self-awareness, which is I don't know how to do something. Where can I go learn how to do it? And then how do I know whether I've learned how to do it? That self-contained ecosystem of learning, the ability to learn. So for example, I talk to adults all the time who say things to me like, you know, you're very creative. I'm not very creative. Or they'll say, you know, and I hear talk to educators who say, I'm, you know, I'm just not good with technology. I just don't, I'm not tech savvy. And my response to these folks, and these are usually college educated, PhD educated folks um, in, my, in my networks, I, I say to them, and this is why I don't have a lot of friends. No, you've chosen not to be creative. You've chosen not to be good with technology. These are choices that you make because the ability to do those things, the ability to learn those things is out there. You're just choosing not to learn them. And that's okay, but as long as you start with that mental state of I am choosing something. So for example, another way of thinking about it is I will never say I am a bad cook. I will say I've chosen not to be a good cook. There's a mental slide, there's a, a mental shift that happens when you think about the world that way because I have chosen to spend my time with other things and not learning how to cook. But if I chose to do that, then I could do that. So this idea of learning how to do things and the ability to learn is critical. And then the last thing I'll say, and, and I heard the speakers talk about this, and I heard about the workforce development and preparing students for jobs of the future and talking about the next workforce. There's a lot of things that we can get into with that subject because I don't think that that's the world that we're looking at. And, and, and you, you're starting to see some of that in the, in the business world. But I, I want to make sure that we are asking students questions. Uh, uh, we're asking students the right questions. So for example, we need to stop asking students what they want to be when they grow up and instead start asking them what problem they want to solve and making sure that they're solving the most important problems that they're passionate about. Because the second question is, how do you want to solve that problem and then the, the third question is, what do you need to learn to solve that problem? So those are the most important things that, that we need to focus on. Now, I wanna see if we have any questions. If we don't, I, I have other things that I wanna cover, but let's, let's look at the questions and, and see what we have there, if we have any. We have no audience questions, perfect. I get to talk more. Okay, so let's let's do this. Let's let's leave that screen up. If we have questions, I will start asking. Uh, I'll start answering those questions. But I want to I want to talk more about this idea of the the asking students the right question, right? So this concept of asking students what they want to be when they grow up doesn't make sense because, look, I when I graduated from high school, when I graduated from college, when I graduated from graduate school, there was no way any of those things could prepare me. To, to work at Google and have a career on the internet because when I graduated from those things, those things didn't exist. There's just no way to think about that. I'm working with people and I'm working on projects and in industries and in jobs that you don't even know about yet, right? So this idea of asking them what they wanna be when they grow up doesn't make any sense. So instead, what problem do you wanna solve? What problem do you want to focus on because that is critical. Now, one of the things that we want to make sure that we're focused on is that we focus on our students. And we don't do a good job of this at all, which is getting them to understand who they are and what they're passionate about and what their skills are and what they're good at. So what problem do you want to solve? 
The second question is, how do you want to solve it? And that's an important question because if someone comes to you and says, I want to solve climate change, you might say climate change, oh, you need to go study STEM. You need to go study uh, science. You need to go get a degree in global sustainable development or environmental studies. And yeah, there are millions of ways to solve that problem on that path. But what if that student is a gifted photographer? What if that student is a gifted educator, that that's what they were born to do? The way they can solve that problem is by going out and documenting climate change, telling stories about climate change. If they're a gifted educator, the way they can solve climate change is by going out and creating educational programs or experiential programs around climate change. There's millions of ways to solve a problem. So how do you want to take your angle to solve that problem? And then the last question, and this is where it all ties into it, is what do you need to learn to solve that problem? What are the knowledge, the skills, and the abilities that you need to have to solve that problem? I see we got a question here, and I want to hide my uh, my column here so I can see the whole question. Uh, how do you how do you uh, propose the issue of getting life skill curriculum back into our schools, specifically urban areas where they have been taken out? Yeah, look, it life skills is 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 an important element to this, right? And and especially for students who are growing up the way I grew up. And yeah, we need to be able to teach them basic things. But again, all this information on how to do this stuff is out there. I, For example, one of the things I often talk about is this idea of uh, digital skills. We need digital leaders. We have done a bad job with this generation in talking to them and teaching them about digital skills. We, 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 we have failed this generation. We have lied to them. We say, you are good with technology. You are, you're naturally gifted. You are just born using technology. And they just don't know how to use it. When you look at the data and you look at a Stanford study from 2019, where one out of every four high school kids can't pull out the fake story when presented four stories, like, like we need to teach them at the at the at the core at the very beginning how to be strong digital leaders so that they can have access to all the information so that they can take advantage of all the skills and all the information that's out there uh how do you address the issues of dni and the difference of black and brown people in technology companies yeah no look that, that's a huge issue a huge problem um, I think one of the most important things to, to think about is to look at it from a different perspective. So for example, again, we, 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 I heard a lot of uh, talk about the workforce development. What most people don't understand in the business world is, and I've studied this generation, and I have one, I have a 20-year-old. I have a 28-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a six-year-old, because I only like one kid at a time. And, and, and so um, I know this generation, the, my 20-year-old's generation, and what most people in the business world don't understand is that 70%, and that's like three different subjects, 70% of this generation doesn't want to work for you at all, at all. They want to do their own thing. They want to have purpose. They want to, they want to drive their thing. So the DNI question, DEI question for me, and I've been saying this for years, is when a student comes to me, especially a black or brown student, especially a student growing up the way I grew up, when they come to me, and I speak to students all over the world, but when they come to me and they say, how do I get a job at Google? My response is, forget Google. Don't get a job at Google. Start a co company that Google buys, right? And so it's a different format to think about. You want DEI? You Fine, let all the technology companies go out there and create all the programs that they want. I could care less. I want to work with students and give them the skills and the abilities to start Google, to get to the next level, because that's what's going to change our communities. Can you apply the asking kids what problem they want to solve to the concept of digital media production training institutions? Uh, yeah, so so my daughter, so my 28-year-old is a, um, She's a, a, a video editor. She's a producer. She works at CNN. She, she makes some of the best fake news you can find. And she is talented, unbelievably talented at the idea of storytelling. So the problem that she's trying to solve is going out and creating a pathway and opportunities for other women, for other lesbian women of color to play in that role, to play in that game, to, to create that. And what she's experiencing is that she is a superstar in that space 
because of her perspective, because of her point of view, because of the way she sees the world. And that's where, that's the problem that she's solving is creating pathways for, for, for girls and women who are interested in, in, in playing in that digital media world. And she's doing an amazing job. And there's lots of young women who look up to her because she is on the cutting edge of doing this kind of work. So what excites you most about the future of tech and how it can expand the Connect Students Network of Support even more? Yeah, look, I, here's, what excited, here's what excited me 15 years ago when I started at Google, which is this idea that if I was ele when I was 11 years old or 12 years old and you asked me a question like, what happened on December 7th, 1941? And if I didn't know, I'd have to say, I don't know. I'm gonna go find out and I will come back to you tomorrow and tell you. Now I have instant access to that answer. What that means is that I don't have to focus on that anymore. I can now focus on the next level of that learning. I don't have to memorize things, I can learn. And so that's what excites me about the opportunity of technology. Also the ability to connect, also the ability to create things. Look, it's, this is not, the matrix. This is not machines versus humans. This is machines and humans collaborating and working together to solve problems. And that's what excites me about technology is that, again, we are using technology that is 158 million times slower than what's coming. And that's just, just as far as we can see, because I guarantee you that once we get there, we'll just look at that technology and say how ancient that technology is or how primitive that technology is to what's coming 10 years after that. Um, what is uh, the most profound answer you have heard when asked students what problem you wanna solve? You know what, you know, here's the thing about that question. The, what's, profound, what's profound to me is every answer. Yeah, it's shocking. It's shocking to me to, 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 to hear adults say, well, we can't ask kids that question because they don't know what problem they want. Like, it, first of all, I'm not even talking about the problem. It's the process of problem solving. It's the process that you go through when you identify a problem and come up with solutions and you iterate those solutions and you keep working on the solutions. So the problem doesn't matter. It's the process that you learn. But there is not one student that I've asked that question to that had an answer to it that has shocked me in any way because it, it's at their core. Now, some students might say, I don't know what problem I wanna solve. And that's a fair answer. And so then, then, the, then the next thing is to go focus on what that answer is and, how, and, and, and understand who they are. Back to my daughter, the film editor, when she came to me when she was starting college, this is the problem is that these students don't know themselves. And if you look at and you reflect on yourself and you ask yourself, did you really know yourself? when you were 16 years old or 17 years old or 18 years old. And, and when my daughter came to me to pick a, when she was had to pick a major in college, she said she was gonna be a business major. And I said, business major? I was shocked because this kid had been making movies on any device since she was five years old. And I said, no, I'm not paying for a business major. And this, no parent ever believes me, but I say, if you wanna be if you if you major in film, if you get an art degree, I will pay for that. And she did, and now she's killing it. Now, my 20-year-old came to me last year and said, I want to be a political science major. And I said, political, you don't even know who the governor is. No, you're not going to be a political science major. Like, kids don't know themselves. So we should spend a lot of time helping them understand who they are and what they're good at and the skills that they have. And all of us who are old, old dinosaurs like me, we can look at our lives and what we're good at and our skills and we can say, man, I wish I knew I was good at this 20 years ago. We have all the tools that are necessary to help our students identify what are they good storytellers? Do they like detail? Are they strategy focused? We have all types of assessments where we can help students do that. Now, I'm running out of time, so I want to I want to close, you know, with with this idea. When 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 back to answering that kind of question around, you know, what's the most profound answer that I've heard answering that question, and and the most profound answer I heard to that question comes from my six year old. When last year, I asked her, Hey, what what what's the, what's the problem that you think about all the time? What's a big problem that concerns you? And she said, homelessness. And she said. She doesn't like to see homeless people and doesn't understand why we have homeless people. And she wants to solve that problem. 
She's five years old. And all she needed to do was sit in the back of the truck, see a person standing by a highway entrance with a sign that says, please help, to know that that's a huge problem. That's what we want to get to. So we want students, by the way, again, this generation of students who, who, who understand things at a level that we can't even comprehend yet, we want them to focus on what they're passionate about. And then our job is to teach them the skills that they need to know to go solve those problems that they're passionate about. So with that, I will conclude. You know, if you wanna continue the conversation, hit me up on Twitter. My message button is open, at Jay Kassop. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm creating a lot of contact. I'm actually filming this right now, which will be up there someday. So lots of cool stuff there. Let's keep the conversation going. And I want to now turn it over to uh, a, a NAF alumnus, uh, Josuel Plasencia, uh, who is going to kind of take it from here. Thank you, guys. What an inspiring keynote from Jamie. Let's give him another round of applause. As we continue to reflect on innovation and look into the future, next up, we will be hearing from our 2021 Alumni Award winners who have already begun to make their mark on the world. The Alumni Awards recognize NAF alumni who have achieved success in their college or career or have demonstrated an entrepreneurial spirit that can be attributed in part to their experience during their time at a NAF Academy. One young woman and two young men who are being honored this afternoon have dedicated their time and talents to give back to other students like them. As a 2020 alumni winner, I am thrilled to introduce them to the NAF Network. Our first honoree hails from Enloy High School Academy of Health Sciences and is currently a student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is passionate about public health and healthcare and advocating for a more holistic outlook for both individuals and communities. I am proud to present Kartik Tiaji. Let's go to his video for more. My name is Kartik Tiaji. I study public health, health policy and management at UNC Chapel Hill. And to me, the need for a more holistic outlook to both individual and community health has always driven my passion for healthcare enabling me to realize that health is about a whole lot more than what we do for folks when they become ill. Going through a pandemic, we can all agree that both health and health care cannot be taken for granted, and neither can the future of this essential industry. The past year has proven that access to health is not just a nice to have, it's a necessity. In my own experience as assistant coordinator for Harvard Medical School's Global COVID-19 Response Technical Support Group, I've been able to be a part of a team that uses data to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in countries like Malawi, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and more. It has been so very fulfilling to gain insights and find answers to the questions that global communities face. I wouldn't have been able to take part in such an insightful and eye-opening opportunities without the skills I developed through the NAF Academy of Health Sciences at Enlo High School in Raleigh, North Carolina. Through my experiences, I was able to jumpstart my academic interests, explore my passion for health, and make lifelong connections through other organizations, namely HOSA Future Health Professionals. I'm so very grateful to mentors like Ms. Debbie Massingill, and Mrs. Benicia Ledford, who supported me in pursuing my aspirations starting my first day as a high school student. Dr. Jim Kenniger, Mrs. Karen Kenniger, Laura Shepard, and Heath Treadway, who have been some of my biggest cheerleaders along my health sciences journey. And finally, my mom, dad, and little brother, whose support is unparalleled and hasn't wavered a single bit throughout the years. As a NAF Alumni Policy Ambassador, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to support high school students and ignite their own passions. As a certified pharmacy technician, I've had the privilege of helping support the vaccine rollout in my local community. 
but most of all, as a NAF alumni, I will continue to do everything I can to advocate for healthcare and health science education to secure a future of healthcare that is committed to the wellness and prosperity of all people in all communities, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status. For those watching who think you might not have it all figured out yet, know that that is okay. I'm in the same boat with you, but also know that you have already accomplished so much. And while the best is always yet to be, don't forget to enjoy the journey while you're on it. In closing, I wanna thank NAF again for this amazing honor for this alumni award uh, and to the entire NAF community for continuously inspiring the next generation of leaders to be future ready. Thank you. Congrats, Kartik. Our second award winner is an alumni from Olympic High School and works as an account manager for Thorn, a nonprofit organization in Los Angeles, California. She credits her NAF experience and internships as providing exposure to the workforce at an early age. Ashley McCullough also provides herself on giving back and even started her own scholarship fund the Ashley B. McCullough Princess Project, providing scholarships to young women at her alma mater. Let's take a listen to her video for her inspiring story. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley McCullough, and I am honored to be recognized as the 2021 NAF Next Alumni Award recipient. I want to start by thanking Mr. Blackett, my former teacher at Olympic High School Academy of Finance, turned mentor and dear friend for nominating me. I am a proud member of the National Association of Black Accountants and we have a saying, lifting as we climb. My story is one I hope many people can relate to. As a kid, I loved learning, but school was a challenging place. My school labeled me as a problem child and was prepared to transfer me to a more disciplined alternative school. I was terrified by this decision. And even at this young age, I realized how these forms of punitive consequences could affect me for the rest of my life. Thankfully, things turned around. My mom, my biggest advocate, stepped in and I transferred to a new middle school that led me straight to Olympic High School Academy of Finance. It was there that I met Mr. Blackett, Ms. Linton, and countless other teachers and role models who would lift me up and help shape me for the trajectory of my life. From there, things took off. Through NAF, I was offered a paid internship at Wells Fargo, where I met real life accountants and got to experience what it was like to work in the banking industry. This initial, initial exposure taught me early on the important role a career can play in a great life. The experiences I had through NAF gave me focus and stronger determination to reach my professional goals. I graduated at the top of my class with a two-page resume before I even started college. Not bad for a problem child. By the time I graduated high school in 2011, I had been awarded enough scholarship money to cover the cost of attending North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. NAF inspired my life NAF inspired my purpose to lift as I climb. I am eternally grateful for the teachers and fellow students who lifted me along the way. In 2011, I launched the Ashley B. McCullough Princess Project at my alma mater, Olympic High School. This scholarship awards one graduating senior girl up to $500 to help fund their education. The Princess Project is in its 10th year, and I am thrilled to have been able to provide scholarships to eight young princesses who've since gone on to attend college and pursue their dreams. I hoped this would help them to understand that they are royalty and have a grand purpose in life, much like I did my freshman year. My career today would not be possible without the initial exposure I received through internships I had in college at, Wells, at Walmart headquarters and Deloitte. I began my official career at PricewaterhouseCoopers, better known as PwC, where I worked alongside some amazing 
intelligent folks who guided my career with love and purpose, setting me up to achieve greatness. Today, I am the accounting manager for Thorn, a nonprofit based in Los Angeles, California, that develops new technology to combat online child sexual abuse. NAV created a launching pad for me to make a positive difference for others, and it is a responsibility I do not take lightly. To my parents, Jenny, Ricky, Fred, and Wanda, and all of my family, thank you for always being my biggest cheerleaders. Mr. Blackett, thank you for showing me the value of having an inquisitive mind. To my incredible teachers, Ms. Sane, Mr. Raylon, Ms. McLaurin, Principal Todd Pipkin, and so many others, I want you to know that your guidance and mentorship have had a lifelong impact on me. Your support inspires me every day to lift others as I climb, playing a role in building our next generation of leaders. Above all, thank God for blessing me with life and this opportunity to speak on my experience. Thank you. Our final alumni award winner, Raimundo Lopez, is a 2015 graduate of Harmony Magnet Academy of Engineering and works as a deep water rig engineer for BP America. Learn more about his incredible accomplishments and his desire to expose more young people of color to engineering in high school. Over to you, Raimundo. Hello, my name is Ramona Lopez, but you can call me Ray. It is a complete honor to be recognized as one of this year's NAF Next Alumni Award recipients. Now, I'm currently on a drill ship working as a deep water rig engineer for BP America. Where my office is literally a huge ship here in the Gulf of Mexico. I feel incredibly fortunate to have a career where I get to work with professionals from all over the world to brainstorm, design, and implement solutions to very intricate challenges here in the energy industry. Now, my drive to persevere through complex issues has both shaped my young career and the person that I am today. To begin, my family and I moved from San Lorenzo, a small pueblo in Mexico, to Portobo, California when I was just three years old. Now, my parents made sacrifices and they uprooted their lives so that my four younger sisters and I could attain a better future than they ever had. They worked their tails off, like most Hispanic immigrants from the area, which included long days in the blistering heat of the agriculture fields. Now, my parents' efforts taught me a lot, specifically to value my academic journey wholeheartedly. I would often hear my father say, Mijo, you can either pick oranges for the rest of your life or you can work hard to get an education and improve the world around you. Now, my common sense and my natural gravitation towards the latter pushed me to enroll in the Harmony Magnet Academy of Engineering. But funny enough, I enrolled at the engineering school and I had no idea what engineers actually did. Now, in the fall of 2011, I walked through the doors of my first NAF class, Intro to Engineering Design, IED, where our first assignment was to design a cup. Our instructor, Mr. Cardula, told us, engineers define problems, and it is your chance to refine a solution. I designed a cup that channeled the heat from the liquid inside to generate electricity and power a phone charger. Now, this was the first time that I understood what engineers did, and I don't just mean design cool coffee cups. Every NAV class from that point forward really gave me insights and experiences to the many ways that engineers use math and science to improve the world around us. My interest specific to the energy industry grew after experiencing the remote Mex Mexican communities that lack the reliable, efficient, and affordable energy that we all take for granted here in the States. I wanted to do my part in empowering communities like these all over the world because it is possible. Through NAF, also in high school, I interned with companies in the renewable energy sector, such as SunPower Corporation and Grid Alternatives. Through these internships and class experiences, I further developed my skill sets before even beginning college. Now soon, not long after, while attending the University of Alaska Fairbanks, I became aware of another barrier. There were far too few engineers of color. And in my view, we needed to expose much more young people of color to engineering the same way that I was through math. I organized other underrepresented engineering students at the University of Alaska to pioneer the first Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and National Society of Black Engineers chapters in the state. Through our efforts and through these organizations, we connected over a dozen students of color with internships or full-time job offers and exposed even more hundreds of younger students in the community to the magic and opportunities within STEM. 
As I continue my career, I want all young black and brown children from disadvantaged communities like Porterville to know that they can have a seat at any table of any STEM career that they work hard towards. As an engineer, that is the biggest problem that I am working to solve. Now I'm proud of this award, not because it represents my efforts, but because it reflects upon my parents' sacrifices. Amayapa, gracias por todo. I appreciate the incredible teachers and faculty who shaped my career from high school to college. Scott Cardula, Horace Toniolo, Jeremy Blackwell, and so many others. Principal Jeff Brown, thank you for recommending me for this award and for the impact that you've left. And to the Portable Unified School District and all the organizers who had the vision and mission to start the Harmony Magnet Academy of Engineering, know that your work is changing lives. It certainly changed mine. Thank you. I hope these stories have motivated you to continue putting in your best efforts to support our future leaders. Congratulations to our alumni award winners for all that you have achieved and continue to achieve while making our society a better place. As we get ready to close out today, I would like to express my appreciation for the NAF network and thank you for joining us this afternoon in making this conference truly amazing. We can't wait to see you next year at NAF Next 2022 in person in Dallas, Texas. In the meantime, I'll turn over back to my colleague Tiffany with a special guest. Thank you. As we say in Texas, howdy. I'm delighted to bring you a message from the mayor of Dallas, Eric Johnson, welcoming you to NAF Next in Dallas, Texas in 2022. Hi. I'm Eric Johnson, the mayor of Dallas, and I'm thrilled to be welcoming NAF Next to Dallas in 2022. Dallas is a great city. It's a wonderful place to live, to work, and to visit. We have incredible restaurants, a lively nightlife, an amazing arts and entertainment scene, and no shortage of sights to see and places to experience. We also value our business-friendly and entrepreneurial culture, and we're dedicated to constantly improving ourselves through education. As mayor, one of my top priorities is workforce and professional development. We must do everything we can to help ensure our talent pipeline is inclusive, highly skilled, and well-trained. We're committed to making sure our students and our workforce are future ready, and we're proud to partner with NAF to support students on their path. Thank you, and we'll see all of you soon right here in Dallas, Texas. Dallas ISD is excited to welcome y'all next summer to NAF Next 2022. Welcome, Welcome to Dallas. Dallas. Well, I know you can't help but be excited for Dallas after that. NAF Nation, that is a wrap on a fabulous NAF Next 2021. I hope you're walking away with some great insights and actions from the phenomenal sessions these past few days. Some key takeaways for me are that we have the most incredible students and alums, thanks to all of you. We are committed to keeping their voices at the center of what we do as we strive to reach for more students. The focus on access, inclusion, diversity, and equity is paramount to that, and it will be the lens through which we look through for all future work. We want to drive faster towards the goal of access for more students, and to do so, we have to innovate, but not complicate. And we can't do any of this alone. We need to keep bringing partners to the table to engage in this impactful and meaningful work with us. With that, thank you to everyone who contributed to sessions, everyone who presented, everyone who joined in, engaged, and listened. I loved getting to see all of you connecting with each other in the sessions while getting such great information. Thank you to all of our amazing partners who helped make this work possible. Congratulations again to all our award winners, our Catherine Blasek Distinguished and Model Academies, and our YOP and Fast Track graduates. And a huge thank you to the incredible NAF staff who not only put on this great conference, but are also constantly looking for ways to better support all of you and of course, our students. I wish we were all gathering on the stage right now for our annual NAF Next photo op. And finally, I'd like to say once again, how honored, humbled, and excited I am to be in this position. Having the opportunity to work in partnership with all of you to create access to opportunity for the students who most need it is truly a privilege that I don't take lightly. I said it on Tuesday and I'll say it again now. Please reach out, share your student stories and your experiences so we can continue to elevate your voices and best support your work. 
You are at the heart of where this work lives, and it's your perspectives that will ensure we continue to transform our students' futures. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the summer, reuniting with family and friends. And I look forward to hopefully getting out on the road soon in the coming year to connect with all of you in person. And of course, I can't wait to see you in Dallas for NAP Next 2022. Thank you.